non-standard monetary operations, including uh, providing liquidity aggressively uh, and uh, buying uh, private assets. Uh, this presents new challenges, uh, policy challenges for both advanced countries and emerging markets. Let me uh, just mention four of these challenges and issues. First, uh, there's the issue of what's the impact of uh, unconventional monetary policies, not only for the countries that undertake them, but also for the rest of the world. Uh, second, uh, what's the exit going to look like? When these operations eventually need to be reversed, what's the impact on these countries, on the rest of the world, and on various markets, including uh, commodity prices? The third question is, uh, does uh, the fact that there are these non-standard uh, monetary instruments, monetary operations, does it mean that the role of central banks is changing? And the fourth question is, uh, uh, and this we hear every now and then, uh, do unconventional monetary policy measures uh, lead to currency wars? Uh, in the IMF, uh, there has been discussion and uh, work ongoing on these unconventional monetary policies. Uh, the work hasn't been completed. Uh, uh, there will be uh, a discussion in the IMF board in a couple of months, uh, but uh, some background work has been done. And uh, uh, actually last week uh, in the IMF, uh, on the IMF external website, uh, a paper was issued that covers the results of this uh, uh, work that has been done so far. And uh, let me just briefly indicate uh, four broad uh, conclusions from that uh, preliminary study. Uh, first of all, uh, the unconventional measures uh, were justified because of economic conditions in the countries and the world economy, also because of broken monetary transmission channels and tail risks. Second, uh, the monetary operations were undertaken clearly to meet domestic goals. And uh, the conclusion is that uh, these were effective domest domestically, especially uh, at the time of the greatest uh, financial turmoil, turmoil. The third conclusion is that uh, the, the unconventional monetary policy measures had a mixed effect on the rest of the world. The early policy announcements seem to have uh, uh, had mainly uh, positive effects on other countries through uh, asset prices that uh, were boosted, and also uh, there's some evidence that uh, these benefited trade. The later announcements uh, seem to have had smaller effects, and also they have led to uh, capital flows uh, to emerging markets, especially to Latin America and uh, Asia, I instead of uh, uh, emerging Europe as before the global crisis. And so far, the magnitude of these flows uh, has been manageable, uh, but at some point, uh, this could become an issue. And the fourth conclusion is that uh, there is some room for further uh, unconventional monetary measures, but uh, their use also involves risks. Uh, the risk is that monetary policy may be called to do too much, and also it might become a substitute for the needed uh, reforms in the fiscal, structural, and uh, financial areas. Uh, let me then go to what Mark mentioned at the beginning, namely uh, uh, challenges for countries in the region. 
as Mark mentioned, we had a conference at the beginning of the week on 20 years of transition in the region and the challenges uh, ahead. And uh, it covered all policy areas uh, in the area of monetary policy. It was clear that uh, good progress has been made in some respects. For example, inflation rates are much lower than they used to be, but there are many challenges. And uh, actually the challenges for these countries are quite different from uh, the ones that advanced countries and uh, emerging markets face. And uh, uh, what's needed clearly is uh, a stronger monetary policy frameworks and uh, uh, deeper financial markets. Uh, the difference uh, in the challenges was made very clear to me during the IMF spring meetings uh, last month. Uh, we had uh, invited for lunch governors from, uh, central bank governors from uh, the Middle East and uh, from the Caucasus and Central Asia. And we had uh, the fund's uh, chief economist, Oliver Blanchard, uh, talking about something that he had uh, written about recently, namely, uh, are central banks becoming too powerful? And so Olivier uh, made his talk and uh, the reception was uh, uh, basically that the governors uh, from the Middle East and Central Asia were very puzzled because they face exactly the opposite problem. They feel that uh, because of fiscal dominance and uh, political pressures, uh, they don't have the power that an independent central bank should have. So in this session, uh, we will discuss various aspects of monetary policy uh, and the global situation. And uh, we, had, uh, we, we have a very interesting composition. We have two top uh, academics and uh, two top uh, practitioners of monetary policy in the Central Asia and Caucasus. And uh, uh, let me briefly introduce uh, the panelists uh, and uh, let, let me tar start with uh, Governor Markchenko uh, of the National Bank of Kazakhstan because he'll speak next because he needs to leave. Uh, and then we have Professor uh, Finn Kidland uh, who together with the next speaker, uh, Edward Prescott, uh, received jointly the Nobel Prize for Economics nine years ago. And uh, the remaining speaker is, the, uh, is, is Mr. Abdullayev, the deputy chairman of the Azerbaijan Central Bank. So with this, uh, let me give the floor to uh, Governor Marchenko. Uh, thank you. I'd like to keep my remarks short because I'm quite keen to listen to two Nobel Prize uh, laureates and I unfortunately have to leave uh, because the forum is a big event and there are quite a few bilateral meetings. <clears throat> so our view is that uh, differently from central banks of uh, uh, large countries, we haven't been doing much of unconventional measures. And in general, you could see the situation in very simple ways. Uh, three big guys, namely US, Europe, and Japan, have been drinking too much for decades. Now they're suffering from a hangover. And uh, smaller sized people or economies have to suffer from that hangover as well, even when we were not drinking. Uh, the biggest issue, and uh, we, I think, all agree on that, is definitely fiscal profligacy and too much debt in all of these uh, three areas and uh, you could uh, discuss about uh, what was the share of the government, of the uh, households and the corporate sector, but clearly that there is a lot of debt and this debt is unsustainable and uh, there's something should be done about this. Uh, but in, in case of Kazakhstan, our government and the Minister of Finance is here, uh, external debt is 5% of, uh, is $5 billion uh, and about 2.5% of GDP. Uh, external assets of the government, uh, national fund, which we manage 
for, for the government is $62.5 billion. So there's a very strong external position. If you take together government external and internal debt, this is something about 12.5% of GDP. Compare that with uh, Europe, US, and Japan, and uh, figures are of different order of magnitude. Um, so in that sense, with all these unconventional measures, if you look at the volumes of lending to the real sector of the economy, in US and UK, they're still uh, below 2008 levels, and in uh, Eurozone, it's flat. In Kazakhstan, uh, overall lending to the real sector increased by 29%, if you look at the last uh, um, five years. And actually, we also have a, we had a problem with uh, a very large volume of debt, but that was external debt of the banking sector, which reached uh, $47 billion, or 50% of GDP, in 2007. Now, in uh, nominal terms, it's uh, commercial banks, external debt is less than $9 billion, and it's uh, less than 4.5% of GDP. But uh, there was restructuring involved, so there is no way around restructuring, and I remember very well uh, when uh, the year before the Greek restructuring, we tried to raise this issue during the European Banking Congress in Frankfurt. I mean, myself and a couple of other people were simply hushed. And because we were told that there is no way that a Eurozone uh, country would have its uh, debt restructured. But it was restructured with a haircut of 73%, which dwarfed the haircut of uh, Kazakh bank restructuring. So, there is a lot of do as I say, not as I do policies, unfortunately still in the world, unfortunately still in the relations between developed countries and developing uh, uh, countries. So, uh, exit strategy is a big issue because all of us, I mean central banks, and not only central banks, but also pension funds, investment funds who have invested in uh, US treasuries and other uh, fixed income uh, instruments of uh, sovereign governments of developed countries, when the exit starts and interest rates go, go up, um, the, we will have to mark to market the holdings of trillions and trillions of uh, developed country securities in our portfolios. And that means incurring a substantial amount of losses. And uh, it's quite easy to calculate if you have several trillions uh, of securities and uh, if you have uh, uh, mark to market only by one or two percent, we're talking about dozens, possibly hundreds of billions of, of losses. And uh, definitely, I mean, accounting standards could be changed again or some approaches could be discussed, but uh, it's not going to be easy and uh, it's going to be painful. And also we don't know when it's going to start. Uh, and we also believe that, uh, I mean, because of these unconventional measures, uh, there are lots of discussions about the mandate of the central bank. Our position is that this mandate should not be expanded, though there are lots of discussions in in Russia, in Kazakhstan, and in other countries, and they are using uh, the mandate of the Federal Reserve System. And they also examples from UK and Canada, uh, where central banks have a broader mandate than uh, price stability. Though there were statements by these central banks but uh, that in the long term, the mandate is uh, more or less limited to price stability, but in the short term, they could also play a role in sort of uh, diminishing the level of um, unemployment or promoting the economic growth. We believe that the central bank should stay with their mandate and that's the only way for them to stay independent. Because the broader the mandate, the bigger the political pressure, then central banks eventually would lose their independence and we will be back to the 80s when, uh, I mean, in most of the uh, countries uh, bar for Germany, uh, there was not much of real independence of the central bank. Uh, the, we used actually the Bundesbank law of 1957 
as a model of our uh, law for the central bank, which was passed in 1995. But it's also not a guarantee that uh, the, the fashion in the international financial community do not change again and uh, the, the mandate of the banks uh, could expand. And I also remember talking about these unconventional measures. When the Fed was taking these measures, uh, 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 a commentator on Bloomberg quoted Fed as saying, we are fully aware of possible implications for international uh, financial system. And then the commentator said, and I quote, which means that Fed does not care about the implications for international financial system. And so unfortunately, large countries have been taking uh, measures as uh, was uh, clearly told uh, by our moderator, uh, with domestic policies inside, and uh, financial, international financial architecture has not been reformed yet. Uh, and uh, these decisions are still being taken without due uh, amount of thinking uh, about what are potential implications for other countries uh, which are not issuing reserve currencies. So I think that for, for us, uh, the key messages are to keep debt low, to develop international uh, capital markets, and to be less dependent on developed countries. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Marchenko. Uh, next, we have uh, Professor Finn Kidron. Thank you, Yuha. Uh, <clears throat> so um, when uh, Max sent me an email telling me about this uh, meeting and uh, what I was expected to speak about, he said, with, with the Prescott and my background in, ta in uh, uh, for our work on the timing consistency of optimal government policy, it was natural to have us uh, lead off uh, this session. And, and I will use as kind of a mild theme uh, what I just described and, uh, and think about uh, in, in light of, what's, uh, of, uh, of that issue, what's going on. Uh, I think that has become much more relevant since 2008. I, I didn't used to speak about time and consistency or rules rather than discretion um, before that. Uh, didn't seem to be a big issue, but I think it's a much, much bigger issue now. Uh, so we can think about monetary policy in, in different nations. Uh, I think there's no question that, for example, in Scandinavia, they take this issue seriously. Central banks there are independent and uh, they understand the reason they need to be independent. And, uh, and there are some other countries in, in, that, uh, in that category. Um, countries that are interesting to think about may be countries that uh, we were convinced were independent or uh, rule-based. Um, I, I would put the United States in that category. And then, of course, uh, with my good friend uh, Domingo Cavallo here, I can't... Uh, Resi I can't avoid talking about Argentina a little bit. So Arge uh, these two countries are kind of interesting to compare. For example, one thing I, I did was take a look at how often the head of the central bank changed. Um, a, uh, a characteristic of, uh, of a central bank that carries, carries out a well-understood transparent policy is usually that the head doesn't change too often. So in the United States, if you go back to 1950, there have been six heads of the central bank, Bernanke being the last one. In Argentina, if you go back to 1945, um, that's 67 years, 54 heads of the central bank. So that's uh, the on the average, each one sat for a year and a quarter. Um, that's quite astounding, and, uh, and uh, if you look at the particularly 
tumultuous year, 2002, the head changed three times in, in one year. Um, there was a change in, about three years ago. Uh, Martin Redrado um, didn't want to, to let Christina Fernandez Kirchner get her hands on the reserves. Out he goes. Um, this, so, so the, the way uh, discretion or, um, manifests itself is it, it, it looks like very short run uh, concerns being dominant among the policymakers. Uh, the United States, um, well, the, uh, as the previous speaker mentioned, these un unconventional measures does concern one. One of the things that happened in uh, Argentina was uh, they came off a terrible uh, decade, the 80s. Uh, GDP, real GDP per capita dropped more than 20%. Um, then things seemed to work pretty well for a while, um, for about eight years. Um, also, um, uh, Menem instituted the currency board, tying the peso to the dollar one for one, accumulated enough reserves to make that seem like a credible policy. Uh, it's uh, to try to gain investors' confidence. Um, but then things fell apart again. And uh, I, I think Domingo would uh, agree uh, that a big factor was uh, although monetary policy seemed quite, um, uh, quite rule-based and, and uh, potentially instilling confidence, uh, fiscal policy didn't. And so even in this period uh, of a growing economy, the provinces kept borrowing uh, to the extent that um, by 1998 or so it became clear they wouldn't be most of them wouldn't be able to pay back their loans. They come running to the, to the federal government and, and I suppose they are obliged to play, uh, bail them out and then everything falls apart. Uh, sometimes uh, if I tell that story and I just mumbled, mumbled the name of the country, uh, some people might mistakenly think I'm talking about Spain. Uh, which I think was in, in a, not to the same extreme, but a somewhat sim similar situation in the sense that the provinces or local governments have borrowed excessively. Um, so, 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 so the tie-in with fiscal policy could be worrisome, and, and that's partly what we've seen in the United States, the, the Fed getting more into fiscal measures buying uh, government debt, buying mortgages, and so on, with uh, worries that uh, were ex expressed well by the previous speaker about the ex exit strategy. Um, and one could also wonder, will these measures, QE3, will, that have, will it have or has it had much effect? And there's very re little reason to think so. I, I saw Marty Felstein, the former head of the National Bureau of Economic Research, describe what the thinking of, of the Fed is. They, they think by doing uh, the QE3, they, they will be able to prop up the stock market. Uh, as a result of the additional wealth, uh, people will consume more and that will make the economy grow a little more. Well, uh, that, that could happen to some extent, uh, I would guess not very large extent, in the short run. And then the question is, if it doesn't lead to a more productive economy, how, how does this uh, feed into, let's say, the solo residual? Uh, or uh, how, do, how does it encourage businesses to invest more? Uh, it, it's hard to see how, how that could happen. And uh, if, if this, um, when this program ends, are we do then going to see the uh, air reversal of, uh, of what they think was a result of, of the QE3? <coughs> um, 
Um, now, uh, as, a, as examples of, uh, of previous experiences, which I think are uh, uh, analogous and to some of what has happened recently, um, one of my favorite examples is uh, Chile versus Mexico in the uh, starting about 1981. So both nations found themselves with, uh, with banks in deep trouble, both because of low uh, and, uh, resource, prices of their resources, copper in the case of Chile, oil in the case of Mexico. Uh, in Chile, for example, uh, banks accounting for half the nation's deposits were illiquid. The government stepped in, uh, decided which banks were uh, viable for the long run. The rest were allowed to go under. And then within a year or two had reprivatized uh, the remaining banks. So markets started functioning, re resources started to uh, flow to uh, the best users as, uh, as one would expect in that kind of situation. And uh, this came at a substantial short run cost for Chile. GDP dropped by 15% in the first two years, but then it started growing. And uh, within, uh, uh, within about 10 years, it, it had grown by about 70% GDP per working age person. Mexico um, did not reprivatize. They, uh, the bureaucrats uh, took over the banks in, in an effort evidently to avoid the, this short run pain. And they were right, the short run pain was much lower. There was a little bit of a drop in, uh, in Mexico. The difference was Mexico didn't start growing. Uh, it, it's amazing to look at the picture for the next 10 years. Um, GDP bounce, per capita bounces around more or less the level it was at in 1981. Uh, so that's an example of the, of the importance of well-functioning uh, financial sector or banking sector and maybe something some countries either should have learned from or uh, uh, should keep in mind in case trouble arises. Um, the other example I like to use is, uh, is China. So, so the timing consistency uh, issue says that even though a benevolent policymaker tries to do his best to, uh, to maximize citizens' wel welfare and chooses policy accordingly, uh, there will sometime in the future there will be a temptation to change their policy. Uh, and and uh, that could lead to uh, uh, sizable drops in welfare. It could lead to questions about predictability. Uh, how likely is this to happen? Uh, lead to uncertainty in, and maybe more so in some nations than in others. Um, in the case of uh, China, you could argue that economic policy is as consistent as you can imagine. Uh, but I, I, I regard that uh, China as an example that consistent policy is not sufficient for uh, good outcomes. Um, and I learned this in a paper by Song Storsleton and Silly um, So a quick, quick outline of uh, what I learned about China is Almost all banks are state-owned. Um, uh, the big state-owned companies have an easy time getting loans. So far, they've had access to cheap labor. Um, and so, not much trouble showing sizable profits, uh, even with, uh, without much innovative activity. Meanwhile, the um, entrepreneurs, the uh, small businesses, uh, small to medium-sized businesses who in most developing na nations are the driving forces, the, uh, the engine of growth in the long run of nations. 
they have a hard time getting loans to put their ideas to fruition. Uh, often they're, um, they're uh, or usually they're, they're forced to save up in advance of, uh, of uh, executing their ideas. Um, generally getting, or predictably getting biased towards more labor intensive activities than otherwise. And so it's a good bet that ev eventually, unless China opens up for more competition in the financial sector, this problem will come back to haunt them. Now, then in the end, I didn't know in advance that the Eurozone was going to uh, be discussed in, in the session before us, but uh, I, I can't uh, resist uh, saying ending on a few words about the Eurozone. And let's see. Um, so uh, I think the discussion about the Euro is a little bit of a red herring when it comes to uh, what has happened in some countries, especially in Southern Europe. Um, and uh, I became convinced of that after I looked at some pictures for, I looked at plots for total factor productivity for three nations, Italy, Spain, and Portugal and also pictures for labor productivity for these three nations. And, and, and these are, let's see, um, how does it work? Uh, okay, uh, I'm technologically challenged, so I don't know which button to, uh, okay, so maybe it's not up. I can, uh, I, I can describe the pictures. Um, in, um, the point of these uh, pictures is labor productivity or total factor productivity went flat well before these countries entered the Eurozone. Italy is especially striking. Um, if you uh, plot, um, let's see, still not up. Uh, if you plot, um, from 1960 um, until 1990, and you look at the uh, average growth rate of uh, both of these two measures, they're, they're growing at healthy rates, uh, not especially low, and then they turn completely flat. For example, total factor productivity in, uh, in uh, Italy, the most recent data, virtually the same as it was in 1990. In Spain, uh, something similar. Um, there, the uh, flattening started a little later, a little closer to the middle of the 90s. But if you look at about 93, 94 on, say for labor productivity, flat, except a slight turning up in, in the past two or three years. Uh, in Portugal, the, the uh, growth in these two measures continued a couple of years longer than in Spain, but then also turned flat. Uh, so, so these, these issues seem much more, uh, it seems that there were much greater problems already before they entered the Eurozone, maybe problems that were hidden as a result of joining the Eurozone. Um, and uh, maybe th there are different ways of, of looking at this, but one possibility is uh, maybe these countries were lucky that the crisis struck because that made these problems all the clearer. And now if they, uh, if, if they do things right, they can solve these problems, or at least they should attempt to solve the problems that led to the flattening in the first place, uh, and then they can keep go get going again in the long run. I realize there's always this concern about the short run, but uh, the long run is always more important than the short run. And uh, as I said, the, the example, the comparison of Chile versus Mexico is a, is a good example of that. Thank you very much.
thank you, Professor Kidland. Uh, next, we have uh, Professor Edward Prescott. Professor Kidland said uh, much of what I had planned to say, um, but not all. <laughs> the, we need fundamental reform in the financial system. Overall, the US and European financial systems on many dimensions have gotten a lot better. The major function of the financial system is to channel savings for retirement into productive investments and do that in a way that doesn't use an excessive amount of resources and which makes it cheap for people to diversify idi idiosyncratic risk, the risk that averages out. There's no way to make aggregate non-diversifiable risk go away. Somebody has to bear it. Um, they create fictions that they've gotten a, made it go away by having tears on these fancy securities that they uh, print and have their rating agents seize. Uh, <clears throat> well, and there's, give them a high rating that permits them to be, uh, that sets up gambling games. The, the small part of the system that doesn't work so well is the uh, transaction. <clears throat> the transaction is, is maybe 10 or 15% of the total. Um, in some sense, that's where the crisis was. So I said, what about some fundamental reforms? I think there was a great opportunity in the US to get people together, to talk about this, to examine, to make long-term plans as to what would be a better system, as opposed to this Dodd-Frank, it's just a matter of uh, when the next crisis will be. And if it's extreme enough, maybe there will be the ne needed fundamental reforms. I've been uh, working a bit on this area. And I find the, uh, and I've been say, why have banks with fractional reserves? Um, what role does that play? Most of financing of businesses is done by mutual arrangements. The Dutch and the developed the stock market, and a huge amount of risk is allocated. The stock market is volatile, it, too volatile for the predictions of theory. We have a good theory of the secular movement based upon the, the productive assets of the businesses, both tangible and capital, and intangible capital. Intangible capital is know-how within the organization, brand names, patents. Microsoft has a huge amount of software that they own. Uh, that's not capitalized. In making that, these expenditures were expensed. What, if, you, if you're a business person and you expense, this lowers your accounting profits. In the United States, it turns out that this intangible capital is as big as, this is McGratton and Prescott recently published papers over the last two years, um, so this intangible capital is, is as big as the 
tangible, brand names. Coca-Cola is worth a lot, as is Microsoft, as is McDonald's, as is Starbucks. Um, it's so the um, so so what's the big problem that's really facing us? Well, how have things changed? I think the big change is demographics. The number of retirees, the number of workers, I should say, per retiree is going down. That means that people, and people are living longer and having longer retirements and healthier retirements. There's less um, morbidity. Uh, the, um, and people say this huge amount, and where are you going to save it? If somebody lends to somebody else, one person saves and one person, one household saves and one household dissaves. In the United States, there's 1.7 GDPs of borrowing and lending between the household. If you look at the private sector, that 1.7 GNPs or GDPs show up as a, both an asset and a liability. And a lot of this, so that's no net saving. Um, so you're stuck. What, uh, there's only two places you can save. It's really business equity. By the way, the household business, if you own a house and rent it to yourself, that's the way the national accountants treat it. That's a household business. Um, but this, it's really just business equity is the savings opportunity. Um, plus, if you use the overlapping generation structure, which the profession has shifted to, in recent years based upon a wealth of micro studies on the behavior of people's savings um, and bequests, et cetera. Um, government debt is the other form. I got into a lot of trouble as a, in the fe not a lot, a little bit of trouble in the Federal Reserve System in the Wall Street Journal editorial. I said, well, Maybe you need a lot of government debt to finance a savings for retirement system. The trouble with that is governments can't honor government or don't, historically, they have defaulted. Some governments can honor much more debt than others. Um, relative to GMP, Japan can have two GMPs of debt. Greece ha will have trouble with one GMP uh, or even less. But the good thing is if we, ref we can reform the uh, tax system and have, don't, don't have that need so that people get a decent return on their savings. The return on capital, by the way, after tax from the national accounts you take the total profits, subtract off taxes, and divide by the value of the capital, of the productive assets. Um, and that's a little bit over 4%. And it has been at roughly that value since the U.S. national accounts, the income side, started in 1920. They, they only go back to 1929 on the income side. So that's relatively constant. The government debt is, can borrow, borrow at a lot lower rate than that. Now all this, say, and you sort of look at what happened. They said the U.S. didn't save. Yet it turned out if you look at the net worth of the private sector, relative to gross national income or gross national product, which is almost equal to gross domestic product in the United States, in most countries. Um, 
that ratio stayed constant. You'd it didn't, uh, if you had a low savings rate, it should have gone down. There's a lot of savings in the form of this intangible capital investment. And then that got realized when you work, when you start a business, you build up a clientele, that's intangible. You, you, you develop a, a strong organization, that takes major investment. You may develop, you innovate, and you have a lot of capital, and your business is worth something and can be sold in the market when you retire and you realize this big capital gains. By the way, during your working life, what do you do? You pay yourself, the owners pay them, or maybe a partnership or a single owner, uh, they pay themselves very low wages so that to keep their tax liabilities down. They want to realize the big capital gains in the future. So currently in the U.S., given the huge corporate income tax rate, half of intangible capital investment is effectively paid for by the government. Half. And this stock is about 1.7 GMPs, is what McGratton and I estimate. But the government gets one half of the return on this capital, intangible the capital investment. So effectively, they are half owners. What shows up on the private balance sheets is much smaller than what shows up, that then the value of the assets. For example, if you have a land, the, uh, the Lucas Pure Endowment Economy, if you if you have land that provides, and by the way, this country has a lot of land, highly productive land. Um, if half the returns are taken, that land will only be worth half as, by the taxes, will only be worth half as much. I see the big problem in Germany, they have a bad, they have a shortage of places to, to save. The old people, the people approaching retirement want to save so that they have so what does the government tell them? Put the money in the bank. We'll protect it. Then the banks say, what are we going to do with this money? Oh, we've got to invest it somewhere. What does the government say? Lend to the Greeks. Uh, everybody can't lend abroad. Norway's a big lender abroad, of course. <laughs> they're, they're, they're oil wealth. And I think I heard some big accounts in Kakistan as well. Uh, but anytime somebody lends a foreign, somebody else has to borrow. So, but if they reform their tax system, they would double their savings opportunities. And there would be no need for much government debt. You could get by with a half a GMP or 0.7. Even with a much lower worker, I, I mean, even with two workers per retirees, rather than three workers per retiree. Uh, it's a simple solution, and it could be... Is I, so I say... By the way, when we look at the data and say, let's see what theory predicts, how do we do that? Well, we start off first abstracting from monetary factors. We treat productivity and tax system exogenously. We start off with a certain initial cap, what the initial capital stocks are, and compute the dynamic equilibrium path or process, um, if there's uncertainty. That path is well, observations are in remarkable conformity with the predictions of this theory. Um, I was, when first did this, I expected to see when there's a big, uh, in the vocal error, error when uh, interest rates were so high in the U.S. where the real interest rate on short-term government overnight it rate went from minus 5% to plus 5% and almost a step function you'd see a big disruption, there'd be a big residual, given we abstracted from uh, 
financial factor, uh, monetary factors, but there wasn't. It just seems to be that the money is what determines the price level. And actually, our central banks, we have a lot less inflations today than we did in the 70s. So we've made some progress there. Uh, but unfortunately, the central banks in monetary policy cannot do much, virtually nothing with regard to output, real variables, output and employment. Um, that's just a fact of, that depends upon the regulatory and legal and fiscal uh, policies. Um, so I guess that basically concludes, I'm advocating 100% reserves to handle the transaction where you can't have a bank run. There's this famous paper by Divig and Diamond on the bank run that has, people are trying to get a reason for to have banks with fractional reserves. There was a reason when we had a commodity money, you economize on the number of people digging gold out of the ground. You saved resources. But once the government fiat money came along, and it's issued by sovereign states, uh, that turned out to be far from perfect, but a lot better. Um, <clears throat> so, just and now with the electronic advances, and things that can be done so fast, we can get virtually all the transactions from debit and credit. Uh, with 100% reserves, you, it's like having, paying interest on it, um, non-taxable. You just credit and debit the accounts to complete the transaction. Uh, it'll be done cheaply, fast, and no chance of uh, a bank run. So, if any of you have a good reason for banks, I've asked a lot of people that, this question. They have not played some role I'm not thinking about, some feature that where they pay it, where they're sort of needed for economic efficiency. Please tell me. Thank you, Professor Prescott. Uh, the final speaker of this session is uh, Deputy Governor Abdullah from Azerbaijan. Dear colleagues, it's very hard to deliver a speech after these interesting remarks of our distinguished guests. But anyway, I will try to share my opinion with you as an practitioner from the emerging um, a market central bank. Uh, to be very brief, I wanted to start. I want to start uh, with the concretely with the questions set up in the agenda of this session. As Chairman uh, said, there were uh, five questions. The first one is, uh, what are the effectiveness and possible risks of non-standard monetary policy measures? In my view. Uh, uh, quantitative easing for now is the only uh, tactical uh, policy to boost uh, short-term economic activity and employment. Although uh, we notice that uh, monetary policy starting to exhaust itself, but in any way, uh, it is the only instrument to affect uh, to somehow support economic growth. Uh, regarding the risk, I think, uh, of course, uh, uh, long-term quantitative easing is uh, uh, risky uh, because uh, it can create, it, uh, again, bubbles uh, in the uh, uh, medium and long term. And, uh, and the, another wave of bubbles, of course, is uh, a potential risk for global financial stability. Uh, I think easy monetary policy uh, might also lead to the uh, flow of uh, cheap money to problematic financial institutions uh, still uh, having a big share of toxic assets in their portfolio. 
uh, from this standpoint, I think uh, central banks should be very careful while injecting money. Um, regarding the second question, uh, the exit from non-standard measures uh, and the, the spillovers to the rest of the world. Uh, given the current scales of uh, tight fiscal austerity measures, I think uh, quick exit is um, impossible because otherwise uh, sudden policy tightening may uh, further worsen economic conditions and uh, even uh, cause another recession. And uh, in this regard, uh, the pace and time of exit, in my view, will depend on the pace and success of rebalancing. Uh, exit uh, will and uh, should be gradual as external demand uh, replaces uh, domestic demand in economic growth, I mean the advanced uh, nations. But of course, the main uncertainty is uh, to what extent the structural transformation in the economy, structural uh, uh, policies will boost productivity to settle a task of rebalancing. This is the main uncertainty. And the third question in the agenda of the session was um, the following one. Uh, it is about the uh, major reconfiguration of the role of monetary policies in the Western world and central, an issue of central bank independence. Uh, I think the fashion of uh, independent central banks uh, will and uh, should still be respected on the global uh, policy agenda, as Mr. Marchenko stated, its importance. Uh, this, is, this is a challenging issue, especially for the uh, emerging nations and especially for the uh, resource-rich uh, countries. Uh, which have a great uh, big amount of current account surpluses. Uh, in these countries, independent monetary policy is uh, the only uh, tool to neutralize the inflationary effects of expansionary fiscal policies. And uh, should be, this should be done, I think, uh, through mainly more flexible exchange rates and uh, through enhancing the uh, transmission role of interest rates in the monetary policy framework. And uh, one of the major preconditions for that is deepening financial and capital markets. Uh, I think uh, the quantitative easing, of course, leads to the lower interest rates in uh, developed nations, and uh, it is catalyzing already and will catalyze probably uh, capital outflows to developing nations. So uh, the best uh, policy reaction uh, for these nations to absorb those shocks caused by intensive capital flows, again, will be uh, more flexible exchange rates, designing more uh, uh, flexible counter-cyclical counter uh, prudential policies, and maybe partly imposing some capital account restrictions. Uh, Tightening monetary policy may also be considered, but uh, I agree with, and I, I respect the view of Mr. Olivier Blanchard that monetary policy might be uh, too blind in fighting against overheating, uh, because in this case, uh, employment objectives might be sacrificed for the sake of financial stability objectives. So we have to be very careful and uh, we have to be uh, capable of uh, balancing between uh, monetary policy, macro prudential policy, and capital account regulation. Uh, the fourth question, I think, was about uh, how central banks from the emerging economies should be prepared for any exit strategies from the advanced countries. I think. Uh, Uh, yes, uh, I partly respond to the question, as in the case of inflow of capital, in the case of outflow of capital, if ex exit happens, interest rates may rise. And from this standpoint, uh, central banks in emerging markets uh, again should respond by flexible exchange rates 
and counter-cyclical macroprudential measures. Um, and the second and last, last question was about uh, the uh, possibility, uh, profoundness of currency wars in the world. I think uh, in the current global circumstances, when the global initiatives on uh, macro enhance, in strengthening macroeconomic policy coordination, uh, the currency wars, uh, I assume that uh, will not be take devastating scales. Uh, only theoretically, I can assume that if fiscal austerity measures are not sufficient to rebalance, that might be used as a uh, last step in boosting economic growth. And if, of course, structural reforms fail to boost productivity, it is not excluded that uh, currency wars may again start. A few words about the policy challenges for the monetary policy in uh, resource-rich countries like my country, Azerbaijan. And the strategic challenging task is uh, when and how to switch to full-fledged inflation targeting framework. This is uh, uh, a very challenging issue, and I think there are a few preconditions of that. And the first one is to eliminate fiscal dominance over monetary policy and to uh, uh, improve uh, macroeconomic policy coordination framework. Uh, second one, uh, gradually move from packed exchange rate to managed float. Uh, and a third precondition is to enhance the degree of monetary control through reducing dollarization, incentives for dollarization, and for the cash economy. Uh, and of course, important precondition would be to uh, enhance a competitive environment in the banking system in order to turn the interest rates into the uh, uh, effective transmission tool in the hands of the central bank. And of course, to be capable to manage the financial stability and to, to have a capacity, technical capacity of inflation forecasting uh, to have early warning systems. These are the main preconditions and Central Bank of Azerbaijan is working in that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Governor Abdullayev. Uh, this was the last uh, speech of this session. Uh, Mark Uzan ended the previous session without questions, but I don't see him here, so let me give you an opportunity maybe to ask two or three questions because we are still behind schedule. And uh, uh, please raise your hand and uh, indicate your name when you ask your question. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm very delighted uh, to see so many uh, fine guests uh, uh, in our uh, fine capital of Astana. Uh, uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, uh, regarding uh, easy monetary policy. Uh, it, uh, it could be uh, already uh, can be uh, called uh, arbitrary and uh, political uh, influence. Maybe uh, it's time uh, for uh, for the banks, as uh, Mr. Uh, Prescott indicated. Uh, we need to get 100% uh, 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 reserves. Uh, then uh, maybe <coughs> since uh, money is not uh, everything and uh, we need, uh, it doesn't constitute wealth uh, and it also uh, fails uh, to stimulate uh, econo economy. Uh, probably uh, and monetary growth uh, is not uh, wealth and is not uh, uh, the good for, uh, for the well-being of, of people and um, people uh, uh, get uh, squeezed uh, by, uh, by un unconventional policies, not only uh, big, uh, by not only small banks, uh, nas national banks, but also uh, uh, even s uh, smaller people like uh, s uh, savers, they can suffer from inflation. Uh, probably uh, uh, mandates must be uh, uh, not only expanded, but only, uh, but uh, mandates uh, of uh, sovereign and national banks must be uh, 
limited and uh, maybe uh, governments should uh, get out of uh, money business altogether and uh, uh, leave uh, uh, monetary uh, policy to the market uh, and uh, because uh, uh, market can uh, create uh, money uh, uh, money is also creation of uh, market uh, uh, from the history of civilization and probably uh, it, uh, it can do it uh, in the most uh, uh, transparent way. Uh, what, uh, what do you think about uh, this uh, proposition? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Other comments or questions? I guess since the mic is right here, I, I feel obligated to ask a question. Uh, two questions, actually. And um, Professor Prescott mentioned, uh, and, and I'll ask this of you only because you're the last person that mentioned it, uh, about the workers per retiree ratio uh, being so low in the United States or falling. Uh, but shouldn't that be adjusted for productivity changes, uh, labor productivity changes? and uh, do we do that? I don't know if that's uh, the case or not. The second question I have is with respect to policies and, and the difference between long run and short run. And of course the long run time path or the steady state is essentially determined by real factors or ex exogenous shocks. The short run deviations from that time path might uh, call for some sort of policies to minimize the cost of adjustment or to return to that long run time path. And we can argue about the policy tools and so forth. But my question really is the burden of adjustment uh, and the return to that long run equilibrium, does it matter who pays uh, or, who, or who bears the burden uh, of that adjustment process? You know, in the long run, we're all dead, but in the short run, only some of us are, uh, depending on the adjustment costs. Thank you. Uh, we have gotten three questions, and I think that's all we have time for. And uh, the, now we would like to hear from the panelists. The last question, I, I, I think I do have an answer, or, and I understand the question. Um, <coughs> Insofar as you use the competitive framework to study the uh, behavior of the economy, the economy gets hit by good real shocks and by good bad shocks. And the, there's the invisible hand plays a role. It minimizes the cost of a bad, sh bad shock maybe in terms of trade shock or something, or, or maximize the benefits of a good shock. Um, it is true that there's, sometimes there has to be changes. And some people's human capital that's specific to an industry or trade may become obsolete. And these people have to gain new skills and move to different industries. Sometimes they change regulations that result in uh, dramatic increases in productivity, like in the iron mines in northern Minnesota in the early 80s. Why did the productivity doubled? And it was just due to changes in work practices. And I don't think there was a, the burden of that. They lost a lot of skilled um, machinist jobs up in the Iron Range in northern Minnesota. Those people came down to the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul. They got higher wages down there. Minneapolis and St. Paul area benefited greatly from having these talented people come. And we could... So... 
there's going to be some changes that are not fully insurable, that are idiosyncratic, and I think the best way to do any system we set up is plagued by moral hazard insurance scheme and having people save a little bit and have a little liquid assets seems to be the best way to handle it. Or sickness shock is similar. Yeah, thank you. Any other reactions to the questions? Yes, uh, I wasn't sure I quite understood the first question. Um, I, in theory, um, having monetary policy guided by a central bank ought to work pretty well with, with the problems that we brought up in our talks. Uh, I'm not sure what the alternative was that was suggested when you said um, leave it to the market. Uh, I, I, w I was wondering if you, th you were thinking of something like Bitcom, which uh, turned out to be uh, more volatile than just about any uh, uh, country's price level. Uh, so. So I don't know if anyone has worked out these, um, uh, what those alternatives could be. I, I, I just can't think of one that, uh, off the top of my head, that would uh, be clearly preferable to, uh, to, to, to uh, monetary policy guided by, uh, and, and provided for medium of exchange and uh, other reasons. Uh, by a uh, central bank. Thank you. With this, we conclude this session and uh, let me thank the panelists uh, for very interesting uh, presentations. Thank you very much. <laughs>